morning and welcome to Hudson Institute, to the Betsy and Walter Stern Conference Center of Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President, CEO of Hudson. This is, of course, Super Bowl Monday. I think a lot of us are uh, probably didn't get as much sleep as we ought to. I do note the uh, winning uh, team's colors here. Great pleasure. My wife is from Philadelphia, though I am a New York Giants fan. I put my my manhood in uh, abeyance last night to uh, cheer on the wonderful Eagles victory. Sorry to you, Patriots fans. Uh, Hudson Institute's a think tank dedicated to U.S. international leadership and engagement for a secure, free, and prosperous future. And I think the subject of today's conference, uh, environmental policy in the 21st century, the future of the Kigali Amendment fits right into this subject matter. So we're delighted to have a wonderful lineup for today's conference. The Montreal Protocol, the full name is the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, is widely regarded as the gold standard for international cooperation on global environmental issues. It was negotiated for the United States by the Reagan administration, approved by the U.S. Senate in 1987. It has since been amended four times with Senate advice and consent, ratified in all by 197 nations, including all members of the United Nations. Through the Montreal Protocol, many potent, potent ozone-depleting chemicals have been phased out. Others are scheduled or proposed for phasing out in future years. While the environmental effects are not entirely free from controversy, the ozone layer has clearly been stabilized, begun to recover, and the treaty has put in place mechanisms for pursuing further progress. The most recent amendment to the Montreal Protocol is the Kigali Amendment agreed to at the capital of Rwanda, Kigali, in 2016. The amendment aims to phase out hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, are widely used in refrigeration and air conditioning, where they have replaced the ozone-depleting chemicals that the Montreal Protocol itself phased out. But the trouble is that the HFCs themselves turn out to be extremely potent greenhouse gases. The Kigali Amendment presents several new and important issues. Is it, as its proponents argue a relatively low cost means of reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Does it hold advantages over other more controversial approaches to global warming? If submitted by the Trump administration and approved by the Senate, could it be implemented and approved? Could it be implemented by the US without amending the Clean Air Act? These and other related issues are the subjects of today's conference. We're absolutely delighted to have representatives of the executive and legislative branch here. Uh, the diplomat members of the diplomatic corps, the media, the think tank world, and industry. And we're especially grateful to the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute for their partnership and support. Delighted to welcome Steve Yurick, uh, president of AHRI, and his colleagues. AHRI graciously supported this event, knowing full well that we at Hudson are fully responsible for the intellectual content of the proceedings and have a diversity of views represented both for and against this amendment. Uh, now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, who is literally someone who needs no introduction, Steve Forbes, the chairman and editor-in-chief of Forbes, the venerable business magazine that recently feted its 100th anniversary. Forbes has grown significantly as a global brand with many new platforms under Steve Forbes' leadership. And though Steve Forbes is known as a businessman, as a magazine mogul, shall we say, he is also at heart, a policy intellectual. He's a trustee of the Heritage Foundation, former board chair of Empower America and Americans for Hope, Growth, and Opportunity, and someone throughout his life who has boldly championed ideas that have changed the direction of the debate and policy here in the United States. His columns are, of course, a must read, but he is also well known for the fact that he twice ran for president of the United States in 1996 and 2000 to promote pro-growth economics via the flat tax and for medical savings accounts. And one of the key campaign platforms in both of his races was the need for the United States to maintain its uh, economic leadership, its technological leadership uh, in order to promote free societies around the world. And I think that these uh, very reasons promoting US uh, economic leadership and technological regions leadership are some of the reasons that have interested him in the subject of the Kigali uh, amendment to the Montreal Protocol. So without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Steve Forbes to Hudson Institute. 
Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, Ken, for those very kind words. First, about the uh, 100th anniversary of Forbes. Uh, we celebrated uh, last September. It was a uh, founded uh, company by my grandfather, who was an immigrant to this country, grade school education, one of 10 children. And uh, he came to this country to pursue opportunities and uh, had a chance to do it. And uh, so last uh, fall, we celebrated our centennial. And I had to, uh, without much success, trying to explain to uh, my two-year-old grandson that it was the magazine that was 100 years old, not me. And uh, as you know, uh, to, uh, to, to, to young kids, uh, when you're above the age of 40, we all look the same. You know, the, the distinctions get lost. And I'm glad Ken made a reference to the colors. We're in a town where if something goes well, everyone takes credit for it. And so, uh, yes, you uh, made possible the Eagle victory. And uh, so, just leave it at that. But uh, it, is, it is good fun to be here, especially at the Hudson Institute, which is uh, out to promote the right ideas, get a very real discussion, which in too many institutions in America today you don't get. And the fact that uh, people aren't protesting here, throwing things at the speaker and things like that is a testament. And one of the great things about the United States, by the way, is it was uh, years and years ago, decades ago, that one began to notice on uh, many of our university campuses, certainly in the faculty, uh, that diversity was a word that meant uh, something to them, i.e. everyone agree. Uh, you can look differently, but you have to agree on everything. And uh, to uh, and it began to stifle real intellectual ferment. And that's where the rise of so-called think tanks has been uh, so good. Think tanks have been around for decades, but they've really flourished over in recent years, precisely because America is an open society where if one set of institutions are failing in their mission, uh, others can uh, fill the breach and get uh, good discussion, good principles on uh, research and policy and open discussion and debate. So uh, thank you, Ken, and your colleagues. You are... Uh, stepping in the breach. The universities can uh, go and be intolerant, but in terms of uh, moving progress forward, which is through knowledge, I think it was uh, Tom Sowell and others have asked, what is the difference between us today and people of the Stone Age? Same human bodies, same planet, same resources, same appetites. The difference between them and us is we know more. We have more knowledge. That is the difference. And knowledge comes from experimentation. Knowledge comes from uh, whether in the laboratory, the marketplace, debate. That's how you move things forward. So even if you have great catastrophes, whether they're natural or war, as long as knowledge is not destroyed and as long as you have an environment where knowledge can be created and preserved and created, we will move forward. You saw that after World War II, immense physical devastation, tens of millions of people killed, nuclear weapons used, People thought it would be a couple of generations before Europe and Japan could recover. Yet with the U.S. security umbrella, within a handful of years, within a handful of years, Western Europe and Japan exceeded pre-war levels of production. Why? Because knowledge was not destroyed. Knowledge could flourish and move forward, and people had the freedom to act on it. So the question today is, uh, should the U.S. ratify and implement the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol? which, as Ken uh, told you, is promoted around the world in the 1980s, vigorously by President Reagan, passed unanimously by the U.S. Senate, also had the enthusiastic support of Margaret Thatcher. The, the answer to the question is, despite all the debate, the Kigali Amendment should be formally ratified and implemented by the United States. As Ken talked about, and as all, you, all of you know, more than 30 years ago, nations recognized around the world the huge danger posed by ozone depletion, hence the 1986 uh, Montreal Protocol, which addressed ozone depleting chemicals, principally CFES, chlorofluorocarbons. In that sense, CFC, CFCs were like uh, no-knock additives to gasoline. I mean, there was, was a great, great chemicals, great things it did for products but it had very undesirable side effects, i.e. we're going to all fry. And uh, uh, additives to gasoline, no knock, great performance for automobiles, but it turns out is pouring lead into the air. Not a good thing. One of the great achievements of the environmental movement was getting lead out of the air. 
So there are times when things that look like they're progress turn out to have uh, more side effects that undo the good of the progress, and you have to change. So developed countries did so, phasing down CF CFCs, starting an era of innovation, and the danger has been sharply reduced. This is one of those rare things that government does that actually had some success. It happens occasionally. It's eliminated over 98% of ozone-depleting substances, putting on us on the track to repair the ozone in the decades ahead, avoided millions of cases of skin cancer, tens of millions of cases of eye cataracts, prevented significant crop loss around the world, encouraged industrial innovations that have given us environmentally friendly technologies. Now, the problem with the hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, is that while they did a good thing, they also have, as Ken indicated, greenhouse gas concentration effects. In other words, they contribute to global warming. Now, whatever you think of global warming, in fact, this is a case where this is human-made. This is not from sunspots or uh, volcanoes or whales or whatever. This is indisputably human cause. Now, fortunately, by contrast, HFOs, many of them hydrofluoroolefins, have a global warming potential that is utterly minuscule compared to what we are doing now. So the Kigali Amendment will reduce these HFCs enough to slow global warming and I know this is controversial in terms of how you measure these things, but I've seen as high as 0.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. Now, just think of that for a moment. The whole Paris Accords, which would hugely devastate the U.S. economy, give China and India free pass to 2030, cost the global economy trillions of dollars, would have 0.5 Celsius maybe by the end of the century and do enormous damage. This could go up to 0.5 and do some good. I don't know what the debate's about. So, 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 so it's simple. CFCs had a nice effect on products, but bad in terms of what it was doing to the ozone. HFCs helped to solve the problem, but it had its own uh, side effects. So HFOs are the way to go. Now, the Kelly Amendment to the Montreal Protocol is indeed, then, one of those rare environmental policies that almost uh, offers something to everyone. You know, Abraham Lincoln was besieged during the Civil War by office seekers and uh, never could satisfy everyone. They, they lined up in those days, you just went to the White House. Always, and he couldn't uh, satisfy all of these job seekers, all of these favor seekers. And so when, after the Gettysburg Address, he came down with a mild version of smallpox, very mild, so it wasn't lethal. And uh, he couldn't help remark to one of his aides, he says, now I have something I can give to everyone. <laughs> and, but, but, the, uh, but the Kigali Amendment, uh, liberals can like it, conservatives like it, business people, environmentalists, politicians, all something for everyone, one of those rarities. For the U.S., it is an opportunity to grow our economy and create jobs while doing something good for the planet. Now, like the Montreal Protocol, the Kigali Amendment has been supported from the beginning by industry. This is not one of those top-down approach to environmental issues driven by technocrats and ideologues. This has been a cooperative effort. It provides industry with the certainty it needs to continue its leadership in this manufacturing space. This is an innovative, technology-driven approach to environmental problems, supported by the likes of sensible approaches. This kind of approach is supported by environmentalists like Bjorn Lomborg. He's a, he's a Dane. He was the former director of the Danish government's Environmental Assessment Institute. He's achieved global, I think, fame, some eyes in infamy, because he takes, in terms of environmental challenges, he takes a cost-effective, practical, result-oriented approach. So, for example, he opposed the Paris Accords, because they're going to do a lot of harm for a very dubious good, a minuscule good. You couldn't do a cost-benefit analysis this was a bad deal. The president had it right on that one. But Lomborg, who is a no Trump fan, have totally agreed with it. So the key is innovation, as he and others point out, whether they call it innovation, green innovation, since we're talking about the environment today. But you uh, talk go back to uh, whale oil, depleting the whales of the world. Now, we didn't subsidize alternatives to whale oil. We had uh, technology, and it came in the form of kerosene much more plentiful than whale oil, didn't kill the whales, and it went down in price over the years, became much more and more affordable. Uh, horses, we all know what horses do. So we got automobiles, great. 
So uh, you didn't have uh, that problem, manure problem. Now we had an environmental problem, so you got a catalytic converter. Didn't subsidize. The problem with subsidies is they keep technology the same. And in terms of knowledge, you learn from failure what works and what doesn't work. When, 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 the, when the government does things like they did in the previous administration, and you get these scandals, there was those failures, those multi-billion, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of failure, these companies they set up with these, uh, with these uh, subsidies, is, as somebody said, the real crime is not the waste of money. It makes us stupid. We don't learn from these failures, the knowledge. You take, for example, in the late 80s, early 90s, Apple came out with a product called the Newton. People who invented it had IQs that could boil water, but it failed in the marketplace. But a technology came through with it, created a company, technology came through it to provide the basis for the iPod, the iPad, and the iPhone, which you might call noble failure. So in the marketplace, in the marketplace, you want the ability to learn, fail, and move ahead. So we got catalytic converters. We forget today, famine, not caused by politicians, but caused by nature, real part of life in India and other parts of the world. Then came the Green Revolution, enormously increased uh, yield crop outputs. No more famines in India, the first time ever. So technology is the key. Now the pluses are enormous. We have represented the industry here today. The heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration industries together are immense. They employ 1.3 million people, have over $80 billion in labor compensation, over a quarter trillion dollars of economic activity. And members of the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute are here today, AHRI. This is, they encompass most of the industry. They point out that the industry has spent over $2 billion on research since 2009 and have committed $5 billion of research by 2025. So this is a multi-billion dollar industry where the U.S. has first mover advantage in delivering a new technology that meets a global demand. And by ratifying the Kigali Amendment, we will stake our claim as the global leader in this emerging technology. As you know, developing countries are choosing now what generation, next generation technologies to select. We shouldn't lose this by default. So the growth potential is enormous. Since the Montreal Protocol was signed, certainly in this country, Air conditioning is more than doubled, but the real market is around the world. It's already gone from 20 billion to 70 billion. And as the world begins, the global economies grow, and they will. What we've been through in the last decade was policy cause, and those are beginning to be changed. The world economy will grow in the, in the next few decades mightily. As you get more middle classes, demand is going to grow exponentially, far more than uh, those crazy computer models can predict. And by the way, on those computer models that made such a hash of the tax bill, those artificial constraints, I'll just say this since I've already had my free bagel. Um, <laughs> I'll say this, is if the Congressional Budget Office really knew the future, they would not be working for the Congressional Budget Office. They'd be buying lottery tickets or buying stocks or speculating in commodities. They don't. You'll learn more from your daily horoscope. This is just, just an amendment. Nothing to do with the Kigali Amendment. So we have a golden opportunity here to compete in developing economies. Although the transition from ozone-depleting substances is for the most part complete in developed countries, only in the early stages in emerging economies. More than 80% of the transition away from ozone-depleting substances still has to occur in these developing economies. There's particular concern, the ones that are going to become humongous, they're already semi-humongous, on a per capita basis, we're going to become more so China, but even on a gross basis, India. So additionally, on the provisions of the treaty, this is important, countries that are not signatories will be prevented from products containing HFCs, from selling HFCs into those countries, which means this, that we will be artificially hurt in terms of an orderly transition. Not a good thing to do. So this will clearly have an impact on U.S. manufacturers who will not be able to make those orderly transitions. So amazing thing is, business is supportive of Senate ratification of the Kigali Amendment since it establishes a schedule for both developed and developing countries, is enforceable to begin an HFC phase down and creates certainty for industry. 
So unlike Paris, which was the most lopsided thing ever invented, uh, this, this, this is much more, much more stable. So knowing what will be required for each region of the world over the next 30 years will enable the investment necessary to implement these new technologies. The scheduling of the amendment provides companies the time needed to adjust their designs to incorporate next generation compounds and get them in the market in time for the transition. This is why this is a smart win-win environmental policy. It supports human health, supports the environment, and supports industry. Uh, fortunately, we have some administration members here. A few months ago, Judith Gaber, official of the administration, said the U.S. believes the Kigali Amendment represents a pragmatic and balanced approach to phasing down the production and consumption of HFCs, and therefore, we support the goals and the approach of the amendment. Now, not being an expert in chemistry, I can say this. Uh, the administration should be supportive in doing it from the rooftops. This is a way to show that in terms of the environment, if it makes sense, if it allows for innovation, allows for practicality, it is very supportive. If it's an idiot agreement like Paris Accords, not going to do it. We're taking the Bjorn Lomborg approach. We want a clean environment. Let's do it in a way that plays to our strengths rather than bureaucratic top-down approaches that are costly and ineffective. Just as an amendment on that one. We all have smart phones. So we used to call them cell phones. Now they're handhelds, whatever you want to call them, smartphones and devices. 35 years ago, we got the first one. Could only do voice. First one cost, well, the, it was the size of a shoebox, weighed like a brick, had a 40-minute battery life. First one for Motorola is $3,995. Now, if they had a cell phone department in government then that said everyone must have access to cell phones, and uh, did a top-down approach. Today, they'd cost $9,995, uh, still weigh like a brick, and still do only voice, and uh, everyone would be wailing about the profiteering of these corporate capitalists, crony capitalists. By having a free market, today, many of these devices are virtually for free. Uh, even Apple, which puts on new stuff, raising the price, you can get it for 40 bucks a month. So it becomes more affordable than over seven billion around the world becomes ubiquitous. So we have to play to our technological strengths. So Kigali does show that uh, we can move forward on a problem that was very real 30 years ago, fry us, and to uh, do something sensible about it. So let's move forward. Perfect. Nothing is perfect in the world. Talking earlier about the football game, Belichick, greatest coach ever, now being skewered today for not playing, uh, play, putting in a player called Malcolm Butler, uh, so if you're at a cocktail party and know nothing about football, just shake your head. I don't know why he didn't play Butler. And people, oh, well, you, really, you, you, you really know something about this. And uh, get, then you can go to the next subject. But, uh, but, but, but with, that, with that, in this imperfect world, this is about as good as it gets. So we should move forward on Kigali, and get it done, and move forward. Thank you. I'm Dave Stevenson with the Caesar Rodney Institute. I um, agree with you 100% that the uh, Kigali Amendment is a, a treaty requiring Senate approval. Uh, and I also agree with the free market comments you have made 110%. So a uh, two, two-part question. One, the previous administration did not submit uh, Kigali for treaty ratification because they didn't think they had the votes. Uh, so do you think you have the votes? Uh, secondly, uh, how is the Kigali Amendment not a regulatory form that's going to interfere with the free market. Uh, without it, uh, there would be competition between HFCs and HFOs. Uh, with it, uh, HFCs have to go away. Uh, well, first, on, uh, on, on, on the Senate, uh, when this was uh, done in 2016, nothing was going to go through the Senate. Not even the Eagles would have gotten through the Senate uh, back then. And uh, so uh, the environment is very different today. And if the uh, administration supports it, that will uh, change the, uh, which it already has, given what uh, that statement made last uh, fall, would indicate that they are supportive. So that would go a long ways. And I think Republicans want to show that they're not anti-environment. They agree with the goals of a better environment, higher standard of living, better quality of life. They just profoundly disagree with the top-down totalitarian anti-science approach that has been taken uh, by the previous administration. 
So in terms of a regulatory environment, you do need to have a ground rules and some certainty, but it does not prevent somebody from the outside who can come up with something even better from breaking in. That's what a free society is about. Uh, not that they are comparable, but I just want to make the point. In cities around the world, the, you had a real uh, talk about regulation. The cab industry was, uh, was uh, very, very rigidly regulated. Cartel didn't prevent Uber, and Lyft, and others from coming in and uh, showing uh, there are different and better ways to do it. So if you have a free economy, if somebody comes up with something super duper on the outside, it will be amendment. And uh, yeah, incumbents may try to fight it, but in a free society, they don't ultimately succeed. And right now, there are stories, this is an aside, there are stories about the evils that shows when, when in America, when you reach a big size and government and pressure groups come after you, you know you've succeeded. That's a sign of success. You saw with Walmart, early 1960s, tiny Northwest Arkansas retailer. How can you compete with companies like Walmart? I mean, Kmart and others, Sears, 50, 100 times your size. Well, uh, Sam Walton recognized that by using these post-World War II, invention that came out of World War II, which was the mainframe computer, originally designed, by the way, originally designed to make it easier to calculate the trajectory of artillery shells. Well, mainframes had many more applications than artillery shells, but uh, uh, Walton recognized that with specialized software and using this computing power, he could manage inventories better than the big people. He had that, he, they had that in, insight, first with the inventories and then with the whole supply chain. So Walmart became the big guy and the big villain. Now today, the villains are, whether you call them fangs, you know, you got Facebook, people don't like Facebook, Google, very discriminatory against, uh, against uh, conservatives in terms of uh, content. So the, 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 these giants now have some real, real issues to address. But and I read a piece in, uh, I think it was maybe the Journal or the Post or something, New York Post, the good post, um, make that clear. But, uh, but, uh, but about uh, the need to break them up. Whenever a company or a group of companies start to get, uh, there's talk about need for antitrust policy, you know they've reached their peak. IBM, government was gonna break that up. Who knew 15, 20 years later it'd have one foot in the corporate graveyard, which it did in 1990. GM was once the big evil company. Oh, break it up, have Chevrolet go up as a separate company. Well, we saw what happened to GM. And on and on it goes. And so if you want to see what's going to undo the fangs or whatever you want to call these big companies, uh, high-tech companies, their stocks, at least until last week, kept going up and up, Amazon and others, is look at what is happening. Look at what is happening, not to Bitcoin, but to blockchain technology. It's about to go to a new generation, which have profound impacts in terms of, uh, terms of security and in other in terms of uh, what can be done. And uh, big companies, even as one as nimble as Amazon, have a hard time doing a second act. Now, Microsoft today, big, strong company, but not the uh, evil take over the world, crushing everybody that it was in the 1990s when the government came after it. So too, uh, this te technology is coming along in a way that's going to be profoundly disruptive to these companies today that seem to be doing everything, you know, content creation, everything. They always, in a free market, will get upended in ways that uh, we can barely see today. You see it time and time again. You have to have faith in people, faith in entrepreneurs. To so answer your question, it does not prevent does not prevent these outsiders from coming up if they find a better way to do it. Eventually, it'll get adopted because people are always looking to do things better. And when you have a free environment, I can't emphasize this enough. When you have a free environment. They'll, they'll always be able to upend seemingly entrenched government-beloved entities. With that, I see uh, Ken about to uh, come up with a polite hook, so I will uh, get down and let the real show proceed. Thank you.